Um, so thank you very much for the introduction. I'm not going to repeat any of that. I've been at Elsevier now for four years. Um, in the last two years, we have implemented WSO2 API Manager, and that was uh, why we were asked to come and speak today a bit about our journey and some of the lessons learned. Um, I'm going to split the talk into sort of four parts, tell you a little bit about who is Elsevier, what is the company, um, why we adopted API management, um, how we've actually deployed that, um, and then uh, a few lessons learned along the way. So the modern company that um, is Elsevier can trace its roots to uh, about 1880, where we started publishing scholarly um, articles. The uh, publishing industry has changed quite a bit since then. More recently, we've moved to providing digital services, providing ebooks and articles online through platforms such as Science Direct, um, as a social network for researchers called Mendeley. Um, but the, the latest chapter um, for our company is taking that even further. That's using this, this data and the content that we've got, applying machine learning and analytics to it, and providing knowledge at the, the point it is needed. Um, and we specialize in doing that in the science and health markets. Um, pulled out a few numbers about the company. Um, some of those are pretty big numbers. Um, <clears throat> so the Science Direct platform has hundreds of millions of downloads each year. The, the analytics and some of the machine learning behind the scenes is extracting hundreds of millions of facts automatically from that content. You just couldn't do that kind of volume with, with uh, manual processing. Um, we've got tens of thousands of e-books <coughs> from many different publishers and societies that work with Elsevier. And our products are consumed by tens of thousands of institutions worldwide. So it's a truly global company. Um, and to get that done, we employ a lot of technologists. So those are both uh, building these products and platforms that we're selling, and also to run the business. We're one of four companies, which is part of the Relix Group. That's on the stock market here in London. Um, so that is a group of companies that provide information-based analytics, decision tools. We focus on science and health. Other companies in the group, they work in fields such as legal, uh, business information, risk, and we organize a lot of conferences around the world every year. So the, the place that I work within Elsevier is business technology solutions. So we're the part of the business that provides IT to run the business. I've given you an illustration of the scale of Elsevier and what we're doing, the amount of customers we've got. So you can imagine we've got lots of salesmen, we've got lots of partners, we've got a lot of data that needs to be integrated. Um, we work very closely with the colleagues who are building those platforms and providing those services that we sell, um, because a lot of that data has to go between those, those groups. We're based in Kidlington, it's near Oxford, it's not quite Oxford, um, but I've got colleagues globally, uh, we're, we're Anglo-Dutch, we've got Amsterdam, we've got America, we've got Chennai, Manila, um, and we've got partners working in lots of other places as well. Um, and Oxford is where the data insights and integration team uh, reside. Now, I haven't got a scary Uber diagram, um, but that did scare the hell out of me, but I, I kind of took a different approach to this. The sort of business landscape that we're working with, we've got SaaSes, we've got big enterprise applications that we need to integrate. We've got the products that I've been talking about, so we've got the ones that are putting that knowledge out there. We've got ones that are helping the content providers actually create and uh, do the peer review process of journals. We've got an intranet. We've got several e-commerce platforms. And powering all that, there's a whole mix of technology, probably any programming language you could think of, we've got somewhere. Um, we're very much into the cloud, a lot running on Amazon, more running in Azure as we go forward. And, so underpinning those applications, we've got all manner of databases, all sorts of um, middleware integration. Dockerization and container management is something that we're going into um, at the moment. So 
the integration space that we deal with is across all these different technologies, all these different um, uh, platforms. Um, I tried to find a picture that would kind of, you know, cover this. And um, I kind of like this one because it does feel like we're providing pipelines of data across the business. But you can see there's some order there. Someone's actually tried to design it. Someone's tried to make those efficient. And that's what we're trying to do with the data. So how did we get and why did we decide we needed API management? So um, let's, let's cast our minds back to 2012. I had to start somewhere. I'm sure integration was going on at Elsevier before then. But you know, that was when the Olympics were here in London. The country was united. Facebook was still young and shiny and la uh, listing on the NASDAQ. And um, you know, those were innocent days where none of us were even thinking about Brexit. But back at Elsevier, um, we'd, they'd, they'd adopted SOA. We had an um, integration platform that was deployed on-premise. Um, there was a lot of batch and file integration going on. They'd built some web services. But it really wasn't delivering that efficiency and that speed that the business was after. Um, it, was, it was complicated. So. Um, Something had to change, and uh, by 2015, uh, the integration team had migrated to Red Hat Fuse. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but um, the open source CAMEL framework is a pattern-based integration framework. It gives developers a, a good <coughs> way to think about how they design their, their integration services. Um, and it's open source, and it's Java, so you can introduce concepts like continuous integration, you can build unit tests, you can build integration tests. So that helped stabilize some of these brittle services. It unlocked the ability to deploy REST APIs, which was something that our consumers were asking for. SOAP was difficult, especially when we layered on encryption and uh, things like that. Um, we, we had a lot of difficulty explaining to uh, consumers how they needed to consume those web services. Um, and at the same time, that was when we moved all our integration into the cloud with Amazon. So that really helped us pivot towards much more service-based integration. And by 2017, we've, we've built quite a lot of services. We're responding faster to the business. Those services are, are more stable. But there's, there's some problems, some of which are to do with the platform. Um, the developers were very frustrated of a, a change that might take them a couple of hours, sometimes took several days to deploy to all the environments. That OSGI containerization wasn't really working for us. Um, a real pain point was our security was inside our integration services. That meant changing a password, adding a consumer. That was a deployment and we've got the deployment pain. So that, that really compounded that problem. Um, and we'd had to bespoke mechanisms for joining up our analytics and data. The fact that the platform split everything into containers didn't really help us with that. Um, so we started looking around, well, what was the next stage in our integration journey? Um, we wanted to unlock the developers from worrying about deployment and spending time doing that. We wanted them to be designing the APIs, making them more reusable. Um, we wanted the consumers to be able to get to these services quicker. We wanted to use standards-based security. We wanted to give them the ability to give themselves credentials, to rotate those credentials, things like that. And so when we looked at the way the industry was going, that's where we concluded that what well, actually we needed to do was put an integration, uh, sorry, an API manager layer in front of our integration layer. Um, and so we kicked off a vendor selection. We looked at quite a long list. We looked at Forrester, Gartner, all the usual suspects. Um, and uh, we kept coming back to WSO2, which actually was one of the first ones we looked at because one of the teams at Elsevier had used it in a very limited way. But it, it fitted the bill, it fitted our open source direction. We liked the fact that there was an enterprise safety net there. 
Uh, the patching tool that you get when you're an enterprise customer has certainly made our life much easier. But this is deployed, so it is out on the internet. So I think as the last speaker just mentioned, security is very much at the forefront of our minds. Um, we need it like that because of those SaaS services that we need to call in. Um, and um, also, when we actually got into the, the detail of this, this was sort of October 2017, we did a POC. It was relatively quick to be able to validate that the features we wanted, we could deploy this, we could manage it in a way. And we were actually into production by February 2018. And that was putting in OpenShift as well and starting to migrate services away from Fuse into a pure open source Spring Boot um, Java microservices to run within that platform. Um, and then the other, thing, the other thing that we needed to support was we're starting to change. Rather than just being an integration team delivering integration services and you know, needing to use Camel to build services to open up other systems, we're finding more of the development teams within Elsevier are building their own APIs. And they're coming to us um, wanting to get that API out into the business. So uh, th this API manager is, I'll move on to this slide. So th this is what it gave us. So the, the security management and by adopting the standard OAuth 2, there are token security that you get out of the box with API manager, that meant we could strip out all the security code from our microservices. They could just start consuming uh, the tokens that the API manager um, issues. Um, those micro uh, and then the rotation of those credentials and things is all just handled in the developer portal. Um, that becomes the central place that our developers can go to find out about the APIs. Um, and immediately they've got interactive testing of those APIs. Before you had to get um, Postman or SOAP UI or something like that involved. And uh, but, you know, it could take a while before you're actually able to call the API. You can do it almost immediately there. Um, something that had been uh, bothering us when we were having to manage our integration services manually was lifecycle management and versioning and how do you actually cope as you uh, have multiple versions and who is using what version and things like that. So having API manager make that nice and clear and having the analytics to tell us who is consuming and how much traffic is going through each version um, made that much easier for us to manage. And that, those analytics, again, that we were able to throw away that bespoke layer um, and we were able to just log in, get our dashboard, see what was going on in our solution. <clears throat> and also what was quite important to us is we had a lot of these legacy services who we weren't actually using the uh, security out of WSO2, but the pass-through mode that you get with it meant that we could still get visibility of the amount of traffic, even if we couldn't tell who was actually calling the API. Uh, it just gave us a consolidated view. So let's just uh, explain where we are now. Um, so as I said, we're in Amazon. We've got three environments. We deployed it that way because the majority of the systems that we integrate with have some form of um, development, uh, integration environment, then acceptance, then production. So we've kind of mirrored that in the way that we, uh, we run our API manager. Um, it's all fully scripted, so Terraform and Ansible to uh, get these environments created. That came in very, very useful when we um, recently this year upgraded to version 2.6. Uh, we started on version 2.1. Um, we wanted to adopt uh, the Open API version 3. That was the, one of the main drivers for us. And, uh, so our integration environment is really there for functional testing. The acceptance environment is deployed to a similar scale to the production environment so that we can do some kind of, we can do sort of realistic performance testing through the gateway. 
Um, and having three separate environments meant that we had to worry about consistency. We wanted to make sure that the AP, a particular version, a particular configuration of an API uh, was published in the same way and in a repeatable way. So we've ended up building um, a deployment pipeline in Jenkins. So that orchestrates the WSO2 publisher API, which you get out of the box. And what Jenkins does is reads a Git project where we've come up with a way of structuring both the API definition and the metadata you need around that. Um, because you can imagine you've got environment-specific endpoints and things like that. You've potentially got different throttling policies in different environments. But that means essentially we've got push-button deployment to each of those environments. So I did a bit of digging into uh, our analytics. And in the, so since February 2018, when we went live, the first six months is probably us migrating our services and a few new APIs that we're publishing. But you can see, really, this year, um, we've really accelerated the number of APIs that we've published. OK, we're, we're probably not up there with the Ubers and the uh, StubHub and people like that. But bear in mind, this is, this is this internal integration that Paul was mentioning. We've taken the API approach to this. Um, that, that growth is to do with two things. It's to do with our integration team being able to spend more time uh, thinking about enterprise services and building APIs that are reusable for the business. And it's that second type of um, API coming directly from other development teams. So we've kind of become, and the, the comment about the center of excellence, the new silo is, is, is quite apt because uh, we're trying not to be the bottleneck for those other teams publishing those APIs. We're trying to give them the advantages of API management, um, but putting some control around it. Um, and again, this is to give an illustration of um, the scale that we're working at. Um, it's not a public API, but hundreds of millions of production API calls a month. Um, the re I was just going to put the production stats on this. But as you can see, the, the, the blue lines there uh, are actually from our integration environment uh, and illustrate some, some behavior that wasn't totally expected by us when we put this live. And it's actually the non-production environments and the traffic in those environments that has been much more important to, to monitor and to manage. Um, those are the environments where developers are trying stuff. It's where they're running scripts. It's, <laughs> it's where they're breaking stuff. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, in August and September, yeah, we, we burst through the 100 million a month mark. and. Uh, and that was remarkably smooth. We didn't actually notice until midway through August that uh, that was happening. So let me share with you, um, uh, I've just got five lessons learned. We've got six minutes left. So um, use throttling. This is why we survived August and September in SID. Um, that was one consumer hitting one API and one operation, all those hundreds of millions of of calls. Um, we, we learned this by some incidents. So in the early days of running this, uh, we wouldn't have survived one developer doing that in SIT. Uh, we had a couple of incidents where uh, one involved a, a typo instead of 10 threads, so one put 1,000 threads and a, a script hitting our gateway with no, no sleep time. That causes cascading failure. Especially in a non-prod environment, the back end can't cope. The API gateway is carrying on trying to pass that traffic through, and then everything starts falling down. We're hosting this platform with 80-odd APIs. We can't have one consumer of one API blocking everyone else out. So it's built in. It's a feature that they provide for you. Use it from the beginning. Plan to use it from the beginning. Um, and now we. We have this conversation every time someone brings an API to us, and we make sure that 
we're protecting ourselves and our service. I think this links back to um, a couple of the, the last presentations. Um, it maybe wasn't obvious to this to us as we started our journey um, from Fuse to, to our current platform. Um, the API is its own product, and separating that out is a different way of working for the developers. Uh, but you need it for the flexibility. If you're actually trying to offer it as a product to your consumers, you need to hide some of your internal complexity. You don't want to publish 10 microservice APIs all to do with your quotes or your invoices. You want to give them one API with a number of operations on it. Um, and API Manager gives you a way of of doing that orchestration at a simple level. We've had to draw a line between what we allow the API manager to do and what we do in integration services. Um, and we needed to do this. We needed to split it out so that we could offer the API management to the other development teams. That Git Jenkins deployment process, that defines what the product is to us, and that's what they have to deliver to us. Um, and we're not there yet, but where we want to go is where where we're, it's not our API and the integration team's API, where we're doing this on behalf of another development team, why should we be having to pull the levers, press the buttons to deploy it? We want to give them that ability so that they can work within the platform. And part of making all that work is embracing open API specification. Um, this was something we hadn't particularly done before we put API Manager in, but the fact that API Manager requires an API, open API specification uh, sort of brought, brought this to our attention. And since we've gone down that route, um, that is now the common language, both in terms of developers talking uh, amongst themselves and talking to the business, with the, maybe with a pretty printed version, not, not the not the YAML or the, or the JSON. Um, and it, it's obviously supported by a lot of programming languages. You can just consume and create a client very quickly from it. Um, but it did mean that we had to change both the process and, and the expectations of the development teams. It wasn't any good anymore just giving us an open API spec that had been mechanically created from some code. We wanted that fully documented. That's going into our developer portal. That's, that's the shop window for the API, and it needs to tell potential consumers what, what do your terms mean, what you're actually going to get from this API. You know, potentially, in an in a enterprise like Elsevier, which system are you actually talking to at the back end, and things like that. So that's been quite a change for us, um, and, and selfishly for the integration team. The more documentation that goes into these, the less work and questions we have to feel when someone goes, what's this API do? I can't make it work. Um, but the moment you put all those together in one place, you start to notice the differences. Camel case, kebab case, people documenting, not documenting, things like that. So um, we've put in place a, a set of API standards. They're evolving. We're, we're trying to actually do them in a way that it helps de development teams and we get feedback from them. Um, but without that, you're going to get lots of different results. And that brings me on to the dreaded governance word. But if you've got a standard, you need a way of making sure that people are following that standard and that we want to run this service in a, um, in a consistent way. And it was a bit of a surprise to us. We probably hadn't thought enough about the processes around API management. You probably can tell from the presentation we came with it very much from a technology angle. But actually, especially when you're bringing in other development teams, you need to be able to interact. Um, so you, you need to think about what's enough for your company. We, we had a pretty mature architecture process. We've tried to make sure that our API governance is wedded with that and that the teams are expecting that there is going to be a review. They can't just publish any old API through the gateway. Um, we've ended up building best practice guides uh, for both consumers and producers, and those are constantly being 
updated. I just ran out of time, so I'll, I'll just say, and also, you don't have to do everything at once. Um, WSO2 API management is very flexible. You can deploy it all in one, you can deploy it in lots of different ways. Um, we just started with a small number of APIs, out-of-the-box security. We've since then added um, some custom security handlers um, based off the open source code. We've taken that and run with it. Um, there's new features like the web sockets where you need a more dynamic conversation going on. Um, and probably the next thing for us is rather than just having public endpoints, we're looking at putting some internal gateways to segment the, the APIs and their availability. So it's helped us with a lot of things. I hope, uh, I hope that was interesting.